we're fast on the switch of this. Oh, yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to, I guess, the last presentation of the session, at least in the regular program of the conference. I'm um, going to talk briefly about QGIS, QGIS and uh, its interface actually. Now this is a Python conference and there is a Python part in this towards the end, but to some extent this is really about the interface and about the biggest uh, GIS application basically in the open source field. Uh, let's, let me see, okay. So my name is Sebastian Ernst. Uh, I'm kind of a hybrid between a geophysicist and uh, an aerospace engineer actually, but lately I've been doing a lot of work as a data scientist, sort of consultant, uh, sort of teaching sometimes. Uh, so I see a lot of those things that you will see from a software side mainly. My co-author Maria is a, a landscape ecologist. Uh, she is mainly using uh, QGIS for her work, for her thesis work. And uh, so we both basically see GIS from, from this different perspectives, but we both have to use it. And now QGIS was kind of the, the thing that we kind of stumbled upon many, many, many times. And uh, because we both were sort of annoyed by it, and actually a few of our friends as well, we decided let's look into what we can do for this, for this absolutely amazing open source tool that QJS is. So let's describe the problem, what we see as the interface, that's kind of the issue, let's analyze how, what we can do about it, and let's suggest some ideas, and let's uh, tell you something about what you can do with Python to improve the situation if you want. So what's the problem actually? So this is kind of what you see when you uh, start QGIS for the first time. Uh, what you see there is actually Bucharest, uh, which is where uh, the FOSS 4G conference happened last week, uh, which is the biggest uh, kind of free and open source geo software conference out there at this point. It's public transport, but you get, like in QGIS, you get a couple of toolbars initially, a couple of what is called dock widgets. It's a typical QT application. It's, doesn't look fancy in the beginning, but um, when you dive deeper into it, you find tons of dialogues in it. That's just a settings dialogue. That looks, it looks pretty clean initially, and it's quite easy to get around this, but then soon you hit more dialogues and more windows and more stuff, which becomes even more confusing the deeper you go. And that's the point when you soon realize that what initially looked easy, uh, it's kind of a very, very deep maze of uh, user interface elements. And that's for the people who are not able to program, really they have to kind of suffer through this the hard way. For myself, I'm mainly a programmer, I will show you in a minute, but uh, this is something I was showing the, the QGIS developers uh, basically not too long ago. That's actually the toolbars of this uh, thing. And if you're used to different types of software, you know this can look better. But when I, look, I showed this to the developers, they had never seen it like this, for the, uh, like all in one image. They said, well, yeah, it's a mess. It's, it's hard to kind of memorize all this kind of stuff. So um, what I want to suggest is QGIS and just any GIS application can look better, can look cleaner. And even in the open source domain, there are tools which look way nicer. They are way more intuitive to use. And just two examples that I personally like, that's uh, LibreCAD. It's one of the, um, let's say, open source CAD applications out there. It's a 2D CAD system, very simple, very nice, and extremely feature-rich. Uh, it has a color-coded interface, so you kind of know when, when the button is green or yellow, you know kind of what it, ha what it means in the bottom. You see this kind of mouse, and there's left and right, there's always help telling you what to do. It's extremely lovely. And the interface is always showing you kind of the tools that you need for a certain job, and everything else disappears but not in this kind of, um, what you say, Apple kind of way where the, the application really hides something for you, from you that you need. It's really kind of optimized for workflows. The other app that I personally like, and I know that's controversial, it's Blender. And um, Blender has a fairly, from my perspective, intuitive interface. They also work quite nice with color schemes and, and stuff like that. And playing around with Blender for maybe one or two hours, you kind of get a feeling for what you have to do, even without reading the documentation. So I got certain things done with this huge app, and I didn't have to read very much of it. So that's kind of, those are kind of positive examples. From the commercial markets, I can only uh, en um, encourage you to look at Autodesk Maya. It's one of the best interfaces for complex apps I've ever seen. Uh, unfortunately, there are no free screenshots available, but if you look for it, you will pretty soon find stuff on Google Images. Now this is basically how QGIS looks for me for most of the time. What you see in the bottom right is the Python console. 
That's actually one of the nicest features of the entire app. You kind of disable all the user interface elements. So all you have left is the map part, which is kind of the upper right now. It's your map canvas. And, and below, you get access basically through the eFace object to everything inside QGIS. And if you don't want to kind of suffer through all those dialogues, you just uh, dive through the API. You can easily explore it with the help function from Python and the, the dear function where you get all the attributes and functions. And you're pretty safe, actually. So this is really meant for programmers, people who know Python, but it's not meant for people who don't know it well or well enough. And that's kind of the niche that, well, it's actually not a niche. It's actually a huge gap that I want to address here. So let's analyze QGIS briefly. What, the, what is QGIS from a UI point of view? It's, it's a very simple UI. It's not even an MDI app like Office in the 90s. So there are no sub-windows or something like that. You, you really have this map canvas in, in the center, some dock widgets, some, some toolbars. And this is kind of really supposed to be the basis for your workflow. And this is how QGIS looked like in the beginning, like 20 years ago. It was a main window, tools, and stuff. And then people started adding features because they wanted a feature-rich uh, uh, GIS application. And this is where all the dialogues in MS come, came in. Um, if you look at the source code, and this was kind of my next step in the exploration of this task, you see that overall it's 160 megabytes. Uh, if you check out the current 3.8, or whatever, uh, this is 3.8.1, but anyway, it's the current version. And out of that, just the C++ code is 25 odd megabytes, which is kind of the, 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 right, uh, the, the red uh, rectangle on the right-hand side. So it's, it's a massive code base. And for an open source app, I was kind of surprised to see this dimension. I mean, it compares to some large Python projects, actually. So just some brief numbers, you get an idea. You're talking about uh, more than half a million lines of C++ in close to uh, 2,000 files, order of magnitude. It's a massive project. One interesting aspect when you look at this, all this stuff is transparent to Python. So they really build Python bindings for all this stuff. There's no compromise here. Uh, you can access all this stuff. Uh, you can derive your classes in Python from it. So it's transparent to you as a developer. And that may be interesting for what's about to come here. Just one of the things uh, we looked into, and those are examples really, is the number of dialogues in this app. And this is simply using the current tree, the source tree, looking for Q dialogues. It's a QT app. And you see it's almost 200 dialogues. Uh, the actions, that's kind of the clickable things that you find in menus and buttons, not counting the click events on, on all the other stuff in the UI that, that you could possibly trace down, it's close to 800. And including the click event, it's, it's actually uh, almost a five digit number. One of the things we also looked into just for fun, I mean, icons. Let's. I mean, you have seen the icons, they were, okay, let's say you, you could improve them. You'll find two, 1,200 and whatever icons that are sort of used as tools in 470 locations across the source code. So that kind of tells you a little bit about the state. I have a lot of respect for everybody who's working on QGIS because you kind of have to navigate this maze and uh, it's not exactly well organized. So there are people who know it and I totally respect them now, I have to admit. How can you solve it? We tried interface experiments. Small group, three, four people. Uh, we looked into what we can we do, and we didn't want to touch the C++. So we resorted to Python. Now, QGIS has a plugin API, API, and I told you it's fully transparent, so why not build really interesting uh, interface experiments? And we started messing around with just about anything. The first thing we realized, QGIS has a dark mode. Fair enough. But can you actually alter the icons, make them more homogeneous? Now this is an early stage draft that we came up kind of just messing around. We have improved it in the meantime. You will find it on GitHub much nicer. The issue is you really cannot theme QGIS. You really have to recompile it and there's a lot of weird pattern matching going on to make it work uh, before you can actually recompile it with new icons. But it's an example. We also try to do stuff like implementing workbenches. That's something that uh, we took from FreeCAD FreeCAD is another open source CAD application and you can basically switch between different workflows and for the different workflows you can disable and enable certain UI elements and switch between them transparently. Again, that's something that QGIS doesn't have. It's just this huge number of tools and so on and so forth. The other thing that it really doesn't have is, is building uh, toolbars. So we built something which you, you can use to build custom toolbars. Now all this is Python, it's pretty simple, it's pr not exactly a full uh, rebuild of the UI, but it kind of was our starting point to say, okay, you can go much, much further with that. 
So we messed around with uh, ribbons, and I do not show you a screenshot here because it looks awful, but the point is we made it work. And from there, you could even put a ribbon interface in here. So where does Python fit into all this? The thing is that QJS has a wonderful plugin interface, and you can really write, write lovely plugins uh, for it. There are hundreds of them in a, in a central plugin repository. You can download them. Recently, this is a pull request against uh, the recent version, 3.8. Uh, you can even have inter-plugin dependencies. This was something fairly new to QJS because the plugins are pretty much an island. They cannot have dependencies themselves, pretty much. Now, recently, you can at least say, my plugin depends on another plugin, which is in itself sort of Python package. But the thing is, this is like one of the many, many emails on the developer mailing list. Uh, the thing is, you really cannot define proper external dependencies. You can make your pl plugin depend on, on NumPy, because NumPy is shipped with QJS, especially on Windows. But as soon as you use something more exotic, like Beautiful Soup, which is totally exotic, uh, soon you'll find that QJS, especially on Windows, doesn't ship with it. And you have to hit upon the right people who kind of try to make it work with QJS and package it. So you, doesn't, you don't have the ability to put proper Python dependencies into QJS plugins. And um, the way to solve it, this is something we came across and we very much like it, and I can only encourage you to look into it. Uh, a couple of scientists actually recently managed to package QJS into smaller chunks for Anaconda. You know, find uh, QJS in the uh, Conda Forge channel. And you can actually build your Conda packages, uh, sort of plugin things, and you can, can have proper setup scripts and metadata and so on and so forth through Conda. So this is kind of a side channel because it uh, opens up a new distribution channel for QJS that you can exploit to make basically proper infrastructure. So what is this all useful for? The one thing I wanted to, want to encourage you as a, as a Python developer in the scientific domain really, and that's what also what we are interested in doing and, 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 and working on is, uh, on the left hand side you sort of see the current architecture. You have this massive C++ app, you have the Python bindings on top, and then you have those isolated plugins. That's how QJS works right now. But QJS can technically be a package. And the people on Anaconda, basically the Conda Forge people, demonstrated that you can package it. Now you could basically understand QJS just as a Python package, equal to other Python packages just running on top of C Python. And there would be, of course, a significant portion of C++ inside. And now you can redesign the interface without touching the source code. And really demonstrate what you can do with it. And that's basically what I want to uh, find people who have shared this interest, uh, people who are using QJS, uh, whether privately or commercially, and um, well, developers who are interested in this sort of stuff, and whoever wants to join us, it's a project website. You find all the contact details, our recent experiments on GitHub, and uh, all the other stuff that we have gathered. We're currently preparing more of those experiments so we can publish them, and uh, one of the ideas actually we want to investigate how much, how far we can go in terms of packaging it so you can actually use it with PIP instead of Anaconda, which would be the next kind of big step to make QGIS a package, uh, which can be then shipped just as a regular Python package. Thank you for your attention.